Hello everyone, welcome to tutorial number 11 in our R tutorial series. Today we're going to be reviewing the factorial ANOVA and this is going to be the third part of a three-part series on independent ANOVAs in R. We're going to continue to be analyzing the alcohol and self-control study data which has a factorial design which is why um, this tutorial is probably the correct analysis for this data. Uh, we got a lot of content to cover so let's dive right into it. First, as always, download the R code and data sets from our GitHub if you haven't already done so. Second, make sure you set your directory to the location on your computer where you save those files. And then third, I wanna make sure every tutorial covers only the new content, new code, and new functions, rather than getting bogged down in code and functions and, and content that we've covered in prior tutorials. So I'm gonna go quickly over um, older content and older code. So if you do find yourself getting a little lost, then I recommend that you watch our prior tutorials to help figure out what we're doing. So let's load the packages we're gonna use in this tutorial. We're gonna disable scientific notation and we're gonna set our directory in preparation to import the alcohol and self-control study data, which is in an Excel file. And we're gonna import it into our data frame called DAT. And we're also going to factor our predictors. So we have two predictors in the study, sex and alcohol. And the reference category for the sex predictor is going to be female. And the reference category for the alcohol condition is going to, or alcohol predictor is going to be um, no alcohol. And the first part of this tutorial is going to review um, some important points about the types of sums of squares in R and why that matters. So if you don't know what type of sums of squares is, then I'm going to direct you to our statistics lecture on factorial ANOVA, where we review this in detail. But you don't actually really need to know the difference uh, to understand um, this R tutorial and how to do a factorial ANOVA. So I'm going to just summarize the key points here, which I've commented off. So the first point is that in R, the default built-in function, this ANOVA function, which notices the lowercase a ANOVA function, its default type of sums of squares is type one. So why is that important? So for SPSS and SAS users, the default is the type three sums of squares. And when I transitioned from SPSS to R, I found myself very confused by the fact that sometimes you get different F tests when analyzing the same data in R versus SPSS. And that happened to me because honestly I didn't know enough about statistics. I didn't actually really know what the difference was between the different types of sums of squares and whether you know why balanced versus unbalanced data matters. So uh, again this is going to be in our tutorial, this is in our lecture on factorial ANOVA but I'm going to briefly summarize the key points here. So in balanced designs meaning you have the same sample sizes for each level of each factor, the type one, two, and three sums of squares will produce the same F test because the nature of the design means that the factors are orthogonal to each other, meaning they're uncorrelated. So for balanced experimental designs, you don't actually need to worry about the type of sums of squares. And if you analyze your data in SPSS, and then you analyze your data using the lowercase a ANOVA function in R, you're gonna get the same results. So, you know, the take home is, you know, if you can get your design to be balanced, you know, it's worth trying to do that. Um, but, you know, the real world research is messy. So unbalanced designs are common. And for that reason, you can get different F tests depending on the type of sums of squares. And the reason why is because in unbalanced design, factors will be correlated with each other, meaning they're not orthogonal. And the degree of correlation can can vary, you know, it's not, um, there can be different degrees of correlation. And the way you can kind of understand this problem is similar to collinearity and multicollinearity, if that's a helpful analogy. So uh, in an unbalanced design, you get these non-orthogonal um, factors. And why that's a problem is because it screws up, for lack of a better term, the partitioning of the variance when you're actually doing an ANOVA. So in an ANOVA, what it's trying to do is pick out unique aspects or unique sections of the variance that is attributable to different predictors or factors. Um, so what that means is in a non-orthogonal design, 
meaning an unbalanced design, you're going to mess up the partitioning of the variance because the, the factors are not necessarily going to be picking out unique um, sections of the variance. So when you use different types of sums of squares, you're going to get different F tests. Now, um, arguably, and statisticians do disagree on this, but I think it's fair to say generally there's a lot of agreement that type three sums of squares are the preferable type of sums of squares for unbalanced data. And also when you think, or when there are statistically significant interactions or interactions are relevant to your hypotheses, which for our um, example with the alcohol and self-control study, it is actually relevant to our, our hypotheses because we believe, at least prior to running this study, that sex interacts with alcohol because we think that there might be sex differences in how alcohol affects self-control depending on how much alcohol a person drinks. Now, this probably explains why um, type 3 sums of squares are the default in SPSS and SAS. That's my suspicion. But, and this is a really important point, in order to get valid results with type three sums of squares, you need the predictors, meaning the factors, they have to be encoded with orthogonal contrast, meaning they sum to zero. And I'm gonna direct you to our R tutorial number 10, where I talk about planned contrast and I explain what orthogonal contrasts are and how you code them. Because type three sums of squares violates what's called the principle of marginality, which is, which is a statistical principle. Honestly, you don't really need to know what that means, what this principle means to understand the key point, which is that if you have type three sums of squares, your predictors must have orthogonal contrast. That's really the most important thing. If you're very interested in what the principle of, orthog or principle of marginality is, then you can Google it and read about it. So what are the three take home messages? First, R's default for the built-in function uses type one sums of squares, which especially for unbalanced data can result in different F tests um, compared to the SPSS and SAS outputs, which are using by default type three sums of squares. Um, yeah, so it's important to pay attention to whether, you know, the type of sums of squares as well as whether or not your data is balanced. And the second big point is for unbalanced data, you basically have correlated factors. So you have this non-orthogonal structure to the data, which messes up the partitioning of the variance. So you're gonna get different F tests depending on the type of sums of squares you use. And the third point is that generally speaking, it's fair to say that type three sums of squares are preferable for non-balanced data or unbalanced data, but especially when there are statistically significant interactions or they're relevant to your hypotheses. But if you're gonna use type three sums of squares, your predictors need to be encoded with orthogonal contrasts. Okay, problem. R's default when defining linear models, which remember, independent ANOVAs just are a linear model. Um, it, but R's default is to use this contrast treatment function, which creates non-orthogonal quote-unquote contrast. They're technically not contrast, they're just dummy codes, which are those zeros and ones which we saw um, in the one-way um, ANOVA tutorial where you, we were comparing where, where R gener automatically generated predictors with uh, zero and one, comparing the reference category with two pints and the reference category with four pints. So if you actually apply the, con the options function, you can see what the default options will be for R. So for unordered factors, it uses these dummy codes. And for if you've specified that a factor is ordered, it'll, it will use polynomial contrasts, which I explain in a second below. Uh, so what's the solution? So if you're using the LM function, so the linear model function, you need to manually define your orthogonal contrast for each predictor before running the LM model when you're using um, type three sums of squares. Otherwise, you're going to get incorrect F tests, incorrect results because you're using non-orthogonal contrast. And there are four ways, thankfully R provides four ways to generate contrast matrices. Um, so you don't actually have to go through that very tedious and honestly difficult process of manually defining contrast, which we've reviewed in tutorial number 10. So the, th uh, the four functions are contrast sum, which creates orthogonal contrast for non-ordered factors. So things like sex, male and female are not ordered categories. Whereas um, it, whereas the, the contrast polynomial creates orthogonal polynomial contrast for ordered factors. So these are things like 
dose, so a low, medium, and high. So our alcohol um, predictor technically is an ordered factor. Contrast Helmert, I'm not going to go into. I personally never really use this, um, and therefore I'm not going to tell you about it. Contrast treatment um, uh, is those dummy codes, which we've already, uh, which I've already shown you. So the key take home is if you're using the LM function and you're going to use type three sums of squares, you need to do three things. First, you need to define the orthogonal contrast for each factor using one of those functions above that creates orthogonal contrast automatically. Uh, and then you need to define your linear model with those, um, with those predictors that now have orthogonal contrast attached to them. And then you're gonna calculate your type three sums of squares using the capital A ANOVA function <clears throat> from the car package. Sorry, I just need a drink of water. Okay, but for the first part of this tutorial, I'm gonna show you the AFEX package. Um, and then I'm gonna show you how to do a factorial ANOVA using the LM package. Now, the nice thing about the AFEX package is that it basically automates this entire process uh, for you by automatically setting orthogonal contrast. So we're familiar now with the AOV4 function. We have our formula. We're predicting self-control sc uh, scores, but we're using the asterisk now because it's going to automatically generate the lower order main effects of alcohol and sex, as well as the higher order interaction between alcohol and sex, and then we have to define our error term because of this is just how the AOV4 function works, which is that's how you define your error term for a independent ANOVA. We're setting our, our sums of squares to type three, although because this is fully balanced data, which we know from our one-way independent ANOVA tutorial, it actually doesn't matter whether or not we use type three or type two, which is what um, the AOV4 function can do. Uh, and then the data frame is our main data frame. So let's run that model. And then we've seen this uh, warning sign before. This is just telling us that, hey, by the way, I've set automatically uh, orthogonal contrast to these two predictors, alcohol and sex. So thank you very much, AFEX package. That's helpful because that's what they need to be since we're using type three sums of squares. So let's run the ANOVA. We got our ANOVA table. It says type three sums of squares. <clears throat> we have our predictors, including the interaction. We have the degrees of freedom of the uh, numerator, which is the model, and the denominator, which is the residual. We have the um, uh, mean of squares of the residual, and then we have the F tests, and then we have our generalized eta squares, which is the effect size, and then we have our p-value of the F test. And the um, what we see is that alcohol is a, is statistically significant, but the interaction between alcohol and sex is also statistically significant. And if you um, you may already know this, although I suspect many don't know this, generally speaking, it doesn't make much sense to interpret main effects in the context of statistically significant interactions because we know, for instance, that alcohol, the effect of alcohol on self-control varies as a function of sex. So interpreting alcohol independent of sex doesn't make much sense. So we're just focusing on the, on the interaction. So we can use the, um, the EM means package, which again, very helpful package. And it has this automatic uh, interaction plot, um, which we've seen before. So in the first argument, we put our AOV4 um, model in the argument. And then uh, because we're looking at the interaction in the one-way independent ANOVA, we didn't actually have a term on the left side of the squiggly mark. So we're now actually including that because we're going to look at the interaction and we're going to plot the 95% confidence intervals. So let's look at this plot. So we have on the y-axis the self-control scores. We have on the x-axis the different levels of alcohol intake. And we have red as female, blue as male. And because these are 95% confidence intervals with overlapping um, confidence intervals, we actually know without doing any post hoc tests that there's no statistically significant difference between men and women in their level of self-control, regardless of whether they drink no alcohol or two pints of beer. Similarly, women, uh, it seems like regardless of how much alcohol they drink, no alcohol, two pints and four pints, they are, for lack of a better term, able to keep it together and they don't, their, their overall level of self-control doesn't significantly decline. But men, 
uh, you know, when once they uh, drink four pints of beer, you know, they just basically fall off the deep end and get very impulsive. Uh, which is what we see here. And at least for some people that might uh, might be consistent with lived experience. But again, I remind you that this data is totally fake and there's nothing real to infer about the real world from this data. So let's actually do some postdoc comparisons to uh, confirm more or less what we just have seen in this plot. So we're already familiar with our, with our EM means function. First argument is the AFEX model, the AOV4 model, I mean, we specify pairwise comparisons, but now we're actually including the interaction term, whereas in the one-way independent ANOVA um, tutorial, you, we didn't actually include that. Because it's not a repeated measures design, our model is going to be univariate, whereas if it was a repeated measures design, it, it's recommended to use a multivariate model to get, um, to get the correct results, um, particularly in the context of violations to sphericity, but we're going to deal with that in our repeated measures ANOVA tutorial. And because we're doing a ton of t-tests, especially in this interaction, we definitely need to adjust for multiple comparisons. And as you can see, I've made your life easy. I've showed you how you can do that for Bonferroni, Tukey, FDR. And then if you're so inclined to see the raw p-values, you can see the p-values with no adjustment. So we're creating this variable called post hocs, which has two objects within it, the estimated marginal means, which we can get here. And we have the estimated marginal means for males and females at each level of the alcohol predictor. So you can see that women more or less stay around the 60 point score for their level of self-control, regardless of what um, amount of alcohol they drink. You can, can see this on the, uh, on the plot. Whereas men, they have the same level, same score on their self-control scale for no pints and two pints, but in the four point pint condition, four pint condition, their self uh, control scale scores go down substantially, um, essentially 30 points. Uh, and, uh, and that's what we see in the plot here. And now we can do our post hoc comparisons to see if these differences are actually statistically significantly different. Although technically the, the, um, the interaction plot tells us that because of the confidence intervals. But for the sake of teaching, I'm gonna do the post hoc t-tests. So that's a, you know, that's a lot of t-tests and that's why you need to control for multiple comparisons because the risk of a false positive increases exponentially with the number of t-tests or number of comparisons you do. So uh, the key thing is to look at the p-value uh, column because that'll tell you um, the, the ones that are statistically significantly different. So no women who drink no alcohol are have significantly different self control scores compared to men who drink four pints and there's a 25 point difference and that's you know a, a very significant difference um, for this one is also statistically significant so women who drink four pints of beer are uh, have a significantly different self-control score compared to men who drink four pints and there's a 26 point difference and then here we have another statistically significant difference for women who drink four pints compared to men who drink four pints, there's a 21 or 22 point difference. And then the last two rows are just comparing the male condition. So compared to men who drink no alcohol and two pints, the four pint, the men who drink four pints of beer are, are uh, significantly more impulsive. And there's a, about a 30 point difference uh, between them. And that's after adjusting for multiple comparisons using the two keys method. And then um, we've seen this in the, tutorial on the one-way independent ANOVA because of the, the type of object that EM means generates, which is a EM grid object. It can't, you can't actually easily extract the estimated marginal means and the confidence intervals in preparation for a GG plot. So you, what I'm doing here is forcing it into a data frame, which I'm calling means, and it's the exact same output. It's just these, these um, estimated marginal means and that allows us to plot them. So what we're going to do is make a, I would say a, a nicer plot compared to the automatic one that the EM means generated here. So we're already familiar with this. Uh, we're no longer defining the data frame and X and Y um, data in the main ggplot function because we want to have different data for different layers of this plot. We're very familiar already now with these different 
functions. We're setting the y limits. The x limit is automatically set by ggplot based off of the levels of the factor alcohol. We're setting the tick marks for the y axis. We're setting the labels and we're putting the legend at the bottom. We're here, we're going to slow down for the geom jitter. We're going to plot the for here, we're going to plot the individual participant data, which is in our main data frame, DAT data frame. We're going to do these little solid circles of size two. And then crucially, we're going to introduce a little bit of a spread in the scatter plot so we can see the individual dots better. Because um, otherwise, they some of them would be overlapping. And we're going to make them somewhat transparent with the alpha parameter. And then we're just telling the this geom that the x-axis is going to be alcohol, the y-axis is going to be self-control scores, and we want them color-coded according to sex. So let's see what this does. So we have this nice um, scatter plot, but we don't actually have the estimated marginal means, which we're going to overlay on top with the geom point uh, function. But we're going to use a different data frame, the means data frame. We're going to plot larger circles and um, we're going to actually use the uh, dodge function, but I'm just going to comment that off for a second to show you um, what happens when you uh, don't use that. Basically, what happens is they're going to plot the dots on these lines here. And we're going to say that uh, the x-axis is alcohol, the y-axis is self-control scores, which is the um, estimated marginal means, and then we're going to color code them according to sex. So it plots the dots and they don't actually overlap, but if we were to plot the error bars, they will overlap. So we won't actually be able to easily see um, where the error bars end, which is why I introduced this dodge. So this is the, the function you position equals dodge and you can play around that with, with that parameter. And that basically determines how far um, away they go from the um, center line for each level of the predictor. So let's run this entire function again, but with the dodge, so you can see what changes. So there you can see they've been, um, they haven't actually changed vertically, but they have shifted horizontally. And that allows us to plot the error bars using the geom error bar. Again, we're getting the 95% confidence intervals from our data frame called means. Uh, I'm for reasons I showed or I discussed in the R tutorial on one-way independent ANOVAs. I don't like the hats, so I set the width as zero. We're gonna have the size of the lines as one. We're gonna dodge the the error bars with the same value of the parameter, the uh, same value as the uh, geom point. That way, they align. The error bars align with the actual points here, and then we are again showing that the we're telling the function that the x-axis will be alcohol, the y-axis will be the estimated marginal means, but crucially the the y minimum is going to be the lower um, limit of the 95% confidence interval, which is in our data frame called means, and then the y maximum will be the upper uh, limit of the confidence interval. And again, we want them color-coded according to sex. So let's run that entire code and see what it generates. And there you go. We got this, I think, at least nicer um, interaction plot showing the individual participant data with their estimated marginal means as well as the 95% confidence intervals around those means. Now we've already reviewed this extensively in detail in the one-way independent ANOVA tutorial in R as to why for AOV4 objects you need to extract the residuals and predicted values in this convoluted manner. Um, so I'm not going to review that but we can we can extract the predicted values and the residuals, um, and I'm just showing you what they are, and we're putting them in this new data frame called new dat. And again, we have the, it's all aligned properly. So the self-control scores, we have the predicted values of the self-control scores, which just are the estimated marginal means, and then we have the residuals, which are the difference between the predicted self-control scores and the observed self-control scores. And now we can plot the histogram of those residuals within that new data frame to just get a general sense of if they're normally distributed and look at that histogram that's really nice it's symmetrical it's bell-shaped which is very reassuring and then now let's use the auto plot function and we're calling the lm object of the aov4 object which remember in the one-way independent anova tutorial the aov4 object will automatically generate um, a number of different objects one of them being the linear model since the underlying math is a linear model of a independent ANOVA.
ignore that warning sign, it doesn't matter. And what we see here is our four plots, which we've reviewed it previously. So our residual plot shows uh, linearity, um, but also, you know, I would say arguably homogeneity of variance, but I'll admit there's maybe a little bit of a difference, but I don't know if that's really um, uh, a major difference, but generally speaking, I would say homogeneity of variance holds true. Um, definitely based off of the normal QQ plot, this looks like a normally distributed residual. The scale location plot basically confirms the exact same story that we saw in the residual plot and the Cook's distance since none are above one, there's no major influential um, observations on the model. We can get quantitative metrics, which we've all we've seen this before in previous tutorials. Um, we can get quantitative metrics of uh, the skew and kurtosis of the residuals. So let's do that. Let's open this up. And the skew and kurtosis basically confirm what we saw in the normal QQ plot that they are normally distributed. And then these special tests of normality also are not statistically significant showing, again, consistent with the QQ plot, which really, in my opinion, holds more weight than these um, quantitative metrics, since there's um, definitely problems with these statistical tests. And there's also problems with Levine's test for homogeneity of variance, but let's just say you felt like, hey, that, uh, residual plot didn't look exactly like there was homogeneity of variance. So if you're so inclined, you can use this, this not very good test called the Levine's test, and it is not statistically significant showing that homogeneity of variance um, is true. You can also do planned contrast in, um, in a factorial ANOVA, but uh, we're not going to show you how to do them uh, here. So you can look at our tutorial number 10 for that. And then for the final part of this um, tutorial, I'm going to review how you do a factorial ANOVA using the LM function. So we're going to use the same data. And I'm just going to scroll down because literally all of this from here down is exactly the same. The big difference is up here. So remember in part one, I, I went on this whole spiel about orthogonal contrast and type three sums of squares. So let's just see what R automatically will do for when defining contrast for predictors. So I'm just looking at the contrast. So you can see these are dummy coded. So that's using the contrast.treatment function because that's the default option that R uses. So these are dummy codes, we've seen these before. What happens if we, if we just use dummy codes and then try to estimate um, type three sums of squares, which is we're using the capital A ANOVA function from the car package. First argument is our linear model. The second argument is defining the type of sums of squares. So look at what happens. So we're using non-orthogonal contrast. So basically these are wildly incorrect uh, F statistics for the main effects, but the, the um, F, F test for the interaction is actually correct um, because basically yeah, I, I won't go into detail, but when you when you feed non-orthogonal contrast into a linear model and then apply type three sums of squares, you're going to get incorrect F tests, particularly for the main effects. So in order to get the correct um, F tests, you need to manually set, as I've said above, the orthogonal contrast using those built-in functions, which I've already reviewed above. Um, yeah, so you need to use those. So let's use them. So the way you define uh, orthogonal contrast using these automatic functions is you use the contrast function. So this basically says the contrast for this predictor, dat, you know, dollar sign alcohol, is this. Similarly, the contrast for this predictor, namely sex, is this. Now, because sex, or sorry, because alcohol is technically an ordered factor, it's like a dose. So no you know, no medication, low dose, high dose, so to speak. You know, it's no alcohol, a little bit of alcohol, a lot of alcohol. So technically, it's an ordered factor, which means technically we need to use um, polynomial contrast. But to be quite honest, if you use the the, the contrast sum, you're going to get the same story. Um, but just because technically this is an ordered factor, we're going to use the polynomial contrast. And in the brackets, you just put the number, which is the, the total number of levels of that factor. 
So let's run that line of code. I'll show you in a second what it generates. Similarly for sex, we're good, because it's an unordered factor, we use the contrast sum function. And within the brackets, we just put the number of levels of that factor, which is two. And I'm gonna show you the results of that. So we can get the attributes of alcohol. So it generates orthogonal contrast, but these are polynomial contrasts. They look a little weird, but they actually obey the principle of orthogonality because if you were to sum all of these numbers, you're going to get zero. Similarly, um, for these two rows. So I should actually mention, sorry, now that we're here. So dot L and dot Q. So the nice thing about the contrast polynomial function is that it automatically generates um, contrast for a linear model and a quadratic model, which a linear model can actually fit a quadratic function. So it, it'll feed both of these types of functions into the linear model. So you can get estimates for both a linear function and a quadratic function because um, oftentimes, although not always, ordered factors do follow a quadratic function. And But these are orthogonal because they sum to zero, both of them. Similarly, let's get the attributes of sex. This is just one, negative one. And again, look at our tutorial on plant contrast, which is tutorial number 10. I go into ex you know, excruciating detail as to how to define orthogonal contrast. And these are orthogonal because they sum to zero. One plus negative one is zero. So we've defined our orthogonal contrast. We've attached them to our predictors. So now when we enter those predictors into our linear model, which is what we're doing in this line of code, they're going to have the orthogonal contrast attached to them. And we're going to finally get correct F tests using the type three sums of squares. And there we go. Look at the F tests. That is the correct result. Incorrect F test using non orthogonal contrast, correct F test using orthogonal contrast. And it is the exact same F statistics as we saw in the AOV4 function. I'm just going to scroll up to prove that to you. So there you go. Exact same F tests. So that's reassuring. Now, because the data is balanced, if we were to use type two sums of squares, we get the exact same F test because the data is balanced. If it was unbalanced, we would get somewhat different results. Similarly, for type one sums of squares, we get the exact same F test because again, the data is balanced because types of sums of squares only matters really for unbalanced data. But for the sake of teaching, I wanted to show you this. And then the nice thing about LM models, as you probably have guessed or may have guessed, you can apply the summary function to get the parameter estimates. So again, the underlying math of a independent ANOVA, whether it's a one-way ANOVA or factorial ANOVA, is that it is just a linear model, meaning it's a multiple regression. So this is our standard multiple regression output. We got multiple predictors, including the interaction, and they're basically, the predictors are contrast-coded predictors. And the nice thing, because we fit polynomial contrast, we actually have estimates for both um, the main effects and interactions, assuming either a linear relationship versus a quadratic relationship. So both, let's just focus on the interaction since that's the one that's the most meaningful, given the reasons I explained above, that it doesn't really make sense to interpret main effects for ANOVAs in the context of interactions. So what this interaction shows us is that regardless of whether we assume a linear relationship versus a quadratic relationship, they're both statistically significant. Although technically a linear relationship is probably more an appropriate model since the T value is higher. But it kind of makes sense if you look at our, our, um, our interaction plot. Let me, let me just show you it. So let's just go back to the automatically generated one. You kind of see that it has this sort of curvature to it, which is consistent with a quadratic relationship. Okay, we're almost at the end of this tutorial. Um, the rest really is the exact same that we've reviewed above, so I'm just going to run through it quickly. We can apply LM models to the EMIP. Um, uh, we can, yeah, to the EMIP function, and we can generate the exact same interaction plot. We can get our post hoc comparisons using the exact same function, which we're going to run all of that. We have our estimated marginal means, our post hoc comparisons. The t-tests are, of course, the exact same because it's the exact same math. And then uh, we can extract our residuals using the familiar M dollar sign fitted values and residuals and stick those directly onto our data frame because we're using an LM object. Whereas, as I told you in the AOV4, in the, sorry, in the um, one-way independent ANOVA tutorial, um, that for AOV4 
function objects, you can't technically do this step because sometimes the, particularly when there's a repeated um, measure factor, you can get the, the order of the, basically the observed values won't necessarily correspond with the predicted and uh, uh, fitted values, predicted and residual values, but because we're using the LM model, we can use this function. And there you go. We have our, our data frame and we just added the predicted values and the residuals. We can also get uh, the histogram by taking our data frame and plotting the residuals. And of course, it's the exact same histogram because it's the exact same data. We can use our diagnostic plot because it accepts LM objects. And there we go. It's the exact same diagnostic plot. And we don't need to review that since it's the exact same data. And then finally, we can get the quantitative metrics of skew, kurtosis, and normality. And they tell the same story that these residuals are normally distributed. And finally, because of the residual plot, if you feel like, hey, I, I'm not convinced that homo homogeneity of variance is true, you can do the Levine's test and you can just feed the linear model directly into it. And again, it's not statistically significant. And just like we saw in tutorial 10, you can do plant contrasts. And I'm going to just refer you to tutorial 10 on how to do that. Okay, we made it. There was a lot to cover. Um, I hope this was helpful. Uh, and we've made it to the end of this three-part series on how to do independent ANOVAs. So thank you very much for your time. I'm always very grateful that you uh, watch these tutorials. And I, as I said, I hope they're helpful. In our next tutorial, we're going to be going into a totally different form of data analysis called a uh, repeated measures um, ANOVA and as a mixed ANOVA. And we're going to be using a different data set. Um, in the meantime, take care. Bye.